Temple Emanuel. Um, welcome to a Zionism for Tomorrow with Micha Goodman, a research fellow of the Kogod Research Center at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. We are really, we're starting off here with Temple Emanuel, and we are grateful to you for being a presenting sponsor of our week of learning. And a huge thank you to Amy for helping to craft this Temple Emanuel at Hartman program. Eventually, we hope that we'll be doing a Temple Emanuel in Israel program, but until then, we're thrilled to be in your homes with you. Um, and to Rabbi West Garden Swartz. On behalf of the Institute, we really also wanna thank Temple Emanuel writ large. We have an incredibly special partnership with you guys. And I, our goal is to be able to have this in many places, um, but you really stand out. And even on Zoom, it feels that way. So thank you to Temple Emanuel and thank you to Amy for her extraordinary work as a board member of the Institute and for being just an amazing partner on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, as many of you know, be largely because of Amy and Wes's work, the Shalom Hartman Institute is a pluralistic think tank and educational center for the Jewish people. For additional learning, you can listen to our podcast, Identity Crisis, or have, and or for heaven's sake, and read our Journal of Jewish Thought sources, and probably check your Friday emails when Amy sends out a really awesome digest of Hartman programs. My name is Jenny Notice Liss, and I'll be helping to facilitate this session with my colleague, Ariel Meiri, who is working behind the scenes. And actually, we are, I feel like we're piloting a plane here. We're actually sitting next to each other in a conference room. Um, and should you have any difficulties technically, you might, you, you probably just want to text Ariel directly. Um, I, I will be much less helpful than that, than he will be. Um, and here are a few things. I just want to go over some things before Micha starts teaching. Um, Micha is going to teach for about the first 45 to 50 minutes. He's going to leave the, the last 10 to 15 minutes for questions. During the time, as you have questions, chat them to me. And when Micha opens up for questions, I will be able to relay your questions to Micha and we'll get to the, as many of them as possible. Okay. Um, this session will be recorded. If uh, and the recording is going to be available on the session webpage within 48 hours. If you do not want you, your video recorded, you can turn your video off. That, that's what my notes say, but I'm also going to add, but we prefer for you all to leave your video on while Micha is teaching. It feels a little bit more engaging. Um, we will post a link to the sources in the chat box. We ask that you do not share the sheets with others. Um, who are not involved with this program, so as to protect the intellectual work of our faculty. Um, you can find out more about Micha by reading the bio linked at the bottom of the session page. And now we are ready to begin our learning and I'm gonna hand it over to Micha, thank you. You on mute. Micha, I think you need to unmute yourself, I'm not. There you go. Shalom, everybody. I don't feel like I'm back home because Zoom is not the real thing. We're still in Galut. We're still in exile. This is not yet, this is not yet me back in Temple Emmanuel, but it's very nice to see some very familiar faces here. It's great to be with all of you. I've changed, I wanna share with you how close I feel with Temple Emmanuel. There was a different title set for this. It was about reflections about the current Israeli government is something I'm very interested in. And I realized I have like something I'm doing this week, another lecture about Zionism. And I started thinking, wow, Zionism is so loaded these days in the United States. And I feel like I used to understand the United States of America. When I was in the United States for more than a year. And I feel like if I come back now, it might be, a, it seems a little bit different than it was when I left you all a year ago before COVID. And it seems like a lot has changed and especially the conversation about Israel has changed. And Zionism itself is a term that's much more loaded. I silently, and also America is also very about, you know, um, um, very, very, there are some parts of America that are very sensitive of the way you speak. And if you say the wrong, the wrong word, the wrong idea, or quote the wrong person, you might, you know, you might uh, be canceled. There's this whole concept which is very foreign to Israelis. 
of cancel culture. Anyway, you start, oh my God, I can't speak about Zionism with Americans before I try it out where I feel comfortable, feel protected, feel at home with my friends, Temple Emmanuel. So this is why, this is how close I feel to you all. And this is also why we changed the title of this lecture. So I wanna speak about the Zionism. I don't even, I don't think what I'm gonna say is very provocative, but you see, that's the thing. I don't know, and I would love to hear feedback from all of you. So that's how close I feel and how, how comfortable I feel here with you all in Temple Emmanuel in Newton. Theodor Herzl wrote two important books about Zionism. One book is called, he wrote in 18, he published in 1896 called The State of the Jews. Maybe that's how he translated Judenstadt, translated the Hebrew as Medinata Yehudim. He wrote that in 1896. And in 1902, he came out with his utopia called Alt Neuland. And those are two important books. We actually have two different takes on Zionism. In a nutshell, Judenstadt, the state of the Jews, is about anti-Semitism. There's anti-Semitism, and that's why we need a, good, a, a state for the Jews. Adnoyland is a different take about Zionism. It's a different take about Israel. It's not about anti-Semitism. It's mainly about innovation. It's about the idea that in Israel, in the future Jewish state, the Jews in Israel will be so inno innovative technologically and politically that they'll create ideas that will inspire the world and change the world. These are two different Theodor Herzls. One Herzl is about Zionism, is about us somehow escaping the world, protecting ourselves from the world. The second Herzl, it's about us not escaping the world, but us serving the world, Israel in service of the world. I wanna offer my understanding of these two Herzls, Alt Neuland and the State of the Jews, and the way I think we could use this distinction today. Alt, the state of the Jews is what Zionism used to be. Alt Neuland is what Zionism needs to be. Uh, if the state of the Jews is what it, Zionism is, the Zionism of yesterday, and Alt Neuland is the Zionism of tomorrow. And this is how I, I, I want to understand the difference. Um, um, the state of the Jews has a very, very important observation, and that is that in the 19th century, Intellectuals in Europe were speaking about, like today we speak about different problems like global warming is the name of a problem. Uh, poverty is the name of a prob problem. Political polarization is the name of the problem. In the 19th century, problems have names. It's interesting, problems have names. The 19th century, there was a problem that had a name. It was called uh, Judenfrage, der Judenfrage. That's how, Intellectuals in Europe called the problem of the Jews or the, the Jewish question. The Jews were a problem that had a name, like global warming, Judenfrage. It was a problem and it had a name. And what is the Judenfrage? The way Jews experience the Judenfrage is anti Semitism, which challenges liberalism, meaning European nation state, on the one hand, they want to be liberal and to emancipate all people and they should all have equal rights. But on the other hand, there is anti-Semitism is a very strong living tendency and emotion. And these two tendencies, anti-Semitism and liberalism clash. That's the Judenfrage. It means the presence of the Jews blocks the ability of European nation states to become what they want to be because anti-Semitism is swallowing their liberalism. So that was, that's the problem, Judenfrage. And hence it was, Helsinki thought like this problem is not going to be resolved. Liberalism is not going to win the argument. That's Helsinki's prophetic observation. At the same time, in the 19th century, there is a different phenomenon, a universal phenomenon. The, problem, the, the phenomenon of nationalism, where different nations believe that they deserve a state of their own. The right of self-determination, that every nation should govern itself by itself. And that's how suddenly the Germans are united and they govern themselves and the Italians fight for their own liberty and they govern themselves. So the Polish and the, and, and the Flemish, and, not, not the, and, and so we have, oh, and by the way, it's a universal idea because all nation states should be organized, should be a part of the family of nations. It's the brotherhood of nations. Today we would say also the sisterhood of nations. That's what it was, it's a universal idea. That, the, that humanity is organized into nations and all nations are one big mishpacha. 
It's one big family. So there's a universal idea of nationalism. The brilliance of Theodor Herzl was taking that universal idea of nationalism and seeing it as a solution to the problem of the Jews, to the Judenfrage. That's the first stage of Zionism. That's Zionism of the Jewish state. It's seeing, it's finding a universal solution to a Jewish problem. Nationalism was a universal phenomenon, family of nation. And they said, you know what? Just like the Italians govern themselves and the Polish govern themselves, maybe the Jews could have a state of their own and govern themselves and that way escape anti-Semitism, which will lead, by the way, to the deterioration, to the, in the end, hell's her thoughts, that, na that Jewish nationalism will lead to the end of anti-Semitism. So that's the brilliance of Herzl, and that's Zionism stage one. That's a Zionism of yesterday. That's a Zionism of finding universal a universal solution to a particular problem. Nationalism as the answer to the Jewish question. That was the Zionism of yesterday. The Zionism of tomorrow is reversing it. If the Zionism of yesterday is finding universal solutions to Jewish problems, the Zionism of tomorrow is finding Jewish solutions to universal problems. That's why I understand the movement from Judenstadt to Altnoyan, from the state of the Jews of Elzeh to, to the idea that the foundation of Zionism is not anti-Semitism, it's innovation. It's not only us escaping the world, it's also somehow us in service of the world. So stage one of Zionism is a universal solution to a Jewish problem. Stage two is finding Jewish solutions to universal problems. That's the framing of this lecture. That's a framing I think might be helpful in thinking about the future of Zionism. What a universal problem that Jewish tradition might have the power to help heal? I don't think it's global warming. I mean, global warming is a universal problem and the Jews should be a part of the solution. But I'm not sure that Judaism has within it the best ideas that could help us heal global warming. Jews participate in that. I'm not sure if that's very uniquely Jewish. I think, but there is another problem, political polarization. Rabbi Jonathan Zacks has a great, great observation. He says political polarization is the societal equivalent of climate change. Let me say that again. Political polarization is the societal equivalent of climate change. So it's like the temperature of planet Earth is going up until a moment where planet Earth won't be habitable anymore. So political conversations are heating up to a level where democracies can't function anymore. So just like planet Earth has to somehow cool down to save planet Earth, our political debates need to cool down to save our liberal democracies. Political polarization is a societal equivalent of climate change. And I think when it comes to political polarization here, it's possible that Jewish tradition, and within Jewish tradition, we have Jewish answers, Jewish ideas that could help heal this universal phenomenon, this universal problem. What is political polarization? Well, my best way of thinking about it is the following. It's a brand of hate. There's many brands of hate. Let's say if I hate someone because of the color of their skin, that's racism. If I hate someone because of their gender, that's sexism. If I hate someone because of a memory I have of something that he or she have done to me in the past, that's vengeance. Pay, there's many brands, there's many types of hate. If I hate someone because he is a leftist, if I despise someone because he supports Netanyahu, that's polarization. When you hate someone because of their political affiliation, that's polarization. And polarization always exists. It's just on the rise. It's on steroids in the United States, in England, in Hungary, in Brazil, in Argentina, and in Israel too. And here's a question. How do we tap into the best of Judaism to be the best out of ourselves, bring the best out of ourselves? How can Jewish tradition help heal polarization? That's a question I want to ask. And Israel, and, and before I ask that question, I want to say something that more and more is becoming hopefully obvious to many people. One of the reasons why 
political polarization is on the rise is because of technology, because of the digital revolution. The, di the digital revolution, which is based on a new economy, the economics, the industry of, it, it, an economy that's based on the idea that you could commoditize human attention, that human attention is a commodity. And the great companies that are, that were, that what they're doing is what Tim Wu from Columbia University calls, they are attention merchants, which means like Facebook, Google, we are giving them our attention for free. And they're taking that attention, repackaging it and selling it for money. And that business of trading with human attention, that's what's creating polarization. Because as a result of all that business, the algorithm that are trying to grab our attention are radicalizing us. And we're trapped within angry tribes that hate the other angry tribes that hate us back. So there's technology, this contemporary technology, the digital revolution based on the attention industry is creating these high levels of polarization. One way to see it is like this, the industrial revolution is creating the problem of global warming. The digital revolution is creating the problem of political warming, of political polarization. And just like we're asking, how do you protect planet Earth from the unintended consequences of the industrial revolution, we should also be asking, how do we protect our democracies from the unintended consequences of the digital revolution? So Israel is a great example. It's a great test case. I'll tell you why. Israel is might be the most successful nation on earth technologically per capita. Israel is a technological miracle. There's more companies that are, that are in the, in just in 2020 that went public in NASDAQ than all of Europe together. Israel per capita is a, is a technological miracle and technological innovation is becoming the symbol of Israeli success on the one hand. But us Israelis were so successful technologically, how successful are we politically? I think the story of Israel in 2020 is that we're success technologically and we are failing politically. And here's a question, the same technology that Israelis are so, which we are so proud of is also the same technology that's creating the politics that we can't be proud of. So what I wanna do now is try to find out what are the sources, the cultural genes of Israeli technological innovation. And there is a book that's tried to, that, that investigated this question. I'm sure many of you heard of this book. Some of you probably read this book, it's called The Startup Nation. And when it asks why are Israelis so innovative when it comes to technology, it answers it has everything to do with Israeli circumstances. The military is a big piece. A Shmone Matayim, A200, the intelligence unit that generates all this creativity. And so all, their, all the examples in the book, are almost all of them, are very Israeli. Trying to say, if you want to understand, Israeli technological innovation, try to understand Israeli culture, because Israeli culture, the conditions created by the Israeli, by the Jewish state, by Israel, is creating Israeli innovation. I have a problem with that argument, I'll tell you why. Israel itself is a startup. Israel itself was born out of tremendous innovation, tremendous creativity, tremendous flexible thinking, tremendous out of the box thinking. Israel, the state of Israel is a product of the spirit of innovation. So logically speaking, to say that the state of Israel gives birth to the spirit of, educate, of, of innovation has to be wrong because Israel did not only give birth to the spirit of innovation, Israel was born out of the spirit of innovation. Therefore, the spirit of innovation had to, had to be there before the creation of the Jewish state. Innovation created the state. The state doesn't necessarily create innovation. So... I want to locate the genes of Israeli innovation in our deep Jewish roots. And I want to start with the Tanakh, with the Bible, and then move to the Talmud to see the two sides of the cultural genes of Israeli innovation. So I want to start with Tanakh. And Ariel, if you could show me, you want to start with a 
with a figure called Gidon, Gideon. And when Gideon was, you know, in the time of Gidon, this was a time where the Midianites were terrorizing, or it was kind of like economic terror. And the Israelites at that time were in despair and they felt like, they felt like they had nowhere to go. And because of, of this despair and because they felt like the Midianites are somehow shaping their destiny and they can't, they don't own their own, their destiny and they have no control over their destiny. So God appears to Gidon for trying to inspire Gidon to take charge of history. And this is what happens. I'll read from Hebrew because the Bible was written in Hebrew. Please feel free to follow me in English or to listen to my Hebrew, the Bible's Hebrew. I'll try to translate on the run. Describes how God appears to Gidon beneath a tree. Okay, some people say it sounds like the burning bush of Moshe. Interesting analogy. We won't go into it now. And God's angel, like God has an appears to Gidon. There's a revelation here. God appears to him and he says, God is with you, hero. God is with you. Hashem imcha. God is with you. Now, the religious traditions are filled with revelations. And there's almost a generic response to revelation. When God appears, people are shocked. And people faint. And people become ecstatic. And people are filled with awe. That's how people respond to God appearing. And here is Gidon. God appears to him. And he says to him, Hashem imcha, God is with you. And how is Gidon going to respond to divine revelation? Well, this is how he responds. And Gidon says, says back, Biadni? Biadni means, he says to him, God is with you. So he says, with me? Biadni? V'yesh Adonai imanu? Is God with us? God appears to Gidon. And Gidon responds to Revelation with skepticism. God is with us. And then he says, um, If God is with us, so why do all these bad things happen to us? That question, why do bad things happen to good people? This is a question that Gidon is responding to Revelation with. Whereas we heard stories about God, the God that liberated our great, great, great grandparents, our, fa our fathers from Egypt. He was there with them. He's not with us anymore. God neglected us. God deserted us. This is interesting. So many times. I remember as a child of asking myself, where is God that used to be in the time of the Bible? Well, it turns out that question was also asked in the time of the Bible. You see, every past has a past. <laughs> and every nostalgic past, when you were then, it also had another nostalgic past. Can I tell you else? Well, because when the Israelites left Egypt, they, they were like, um, why, why? Why did we leave Egypt? It was better then. Every past has a past. So, so here we have Revelation, and you have Gidon responding to Revelation with skepticism and with chutzpah. So now what's going to happen to Gidon? Instead of being in awe, he's skeptical and is rejecting what God says to him. What's going to happen to him? It's like lightning going to come out from the sky and kill him. Is the land going to be open and swallowed? What's going to happen to Gidon? How is God to respond to his chutzpahic skepticism? How is God to respond to that? Well, here's how God responds. The next verse, God approaches him and he says to him, Go with this strength and save Israel. With this strength. What is God not saying to him? He's not saying, first of all, calm down. 
respect me. Get over your skepticism. And if you'll do that and be more pious, then you'll be chosen to save Israel. That's not what he said. He said the opposite. He said, go with this strength, the strength that you have that enables you to question God's existence, to express skepticism in the face of revelation. This chutzpah that you have, this is the strength you will free Israel with. You will save Israel with. God tells Gidon, as opposed, as opposed to what we'd expect, that because Gidon is not surrendering himself to God, because he's not a yes man, that's why he's chosen. That's why he can save Israel. That's the strength. The strength that doesn't accept authority. The strength that enables people to think out of the box because there is no box to begin with. Because they're so free, because because they're courageous and free thinkers. That's the energy that can save Israel. Lech mekoch with this strength and save Israel. Wow. That's how, that's, that was a surprise. Surprise number one was how Gidon responds to Revelation. Surprise number two is how God responds to his response. That's what I want. The fact that you're not a yes man. That's why I chose you. With that strength, go save Israel. Now this idea of Gidon, it's not the first time in biblical historiography that we have a hero that doesn't surrender himself to God. Actually, the founding father of this tradition is Abraham. Uh, Ariel, let's move down to Abraham for a minute. Yes. And this is the famous verses. These are the famous verses. When God tells Abraham that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, how does Abraham respond? We expect the, respond, the response to be, well, God, if that's what you want, that's what's going to happen. And you know better than us. And Abraham surrendering himself to God. But that wasn't Abraham's response. God, Abraham's response was different. Abraham responds to God's declaration with a question. Are you really going to do this to kill innocent people among the vicious people of Sodom? And then he goes on, I'm, I'm skipping to verse 25, where he says, Abraham says to God, don't you dare do that. You're not allowed to kill innocent people among vicious people. Which is like, we're so, we always expect God to criticize human beings. But the Bible presents a human being that criticizes God. And then he says, Is the God of justice not going to do justice? Again, it's all reversed. God doesn't criticize Abraham. Abraham criticizes God. So Gidon inherits this tradition. Not only Gidon, by the way, Moshe Rabbeinu, yes, is also a part of this tradition. If we go down to the next, to the next verse, this is from Parashat Korach. We'll just do it very quickly. In part number three, when God says to, 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 to Moses, he's not only going to kill Korach, but also 250 people that joined him in the coalition. So Moshe, speaks to God. I'm, very, I'm reading from verse 21. He, uh, he, but sorry, verse 22. Moshe and Aaron together say, they fall on their faces when they realize that God wants to kill all 250 men. And they say, Really? One person sins. And now you want to have a collective punishment. It's very similar to Abraham. You're going to kill innocent people for the sin of one person, of one not innocent person. Again, there's a tradition here of Abraham, of Moshe, of Gidon. Ariel, maybe there's now time to go, to, 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 to go back. This is a tradition that the best way to capture it. No, no, no. Uh, um, let's go back, not, not, not from, to, to, uh, to the regular screen. Um, this is a tradition 
that my teacher Avi Ravitsky once put it this way. This tradition, by the way, doesn't stop at Gidon. Jeremiah chapter 11 does the same. The book of Habakkuk does the same. The entire book of Job does the same. There's chapters in Psalm that does the same. What are they all doing? Well, you see, human beings, us human beings, I think I shared this with my, our friends in Tipoli Emmanuel a few years ago. We are changed by what we admire. If you admire athletes, there's a good chance you'll be more sporty. If you admire intellectuals, there's a good chance they'll be reading more books. We become what we, like admiration changes the admirer, right? If you admire famous people just because they're famous, you might become more narcissistic. That's a problem we have in Western civilization, by the way. What does it do to a civilization that admires Abraham, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Gideon, Moshe? What does it do to a civilization that admires not the people that surrender to God, but the people who dare to criticize God? What does it do to us? So my teacher, Avi Ravitsky, compares this to a Christian tradition that speaks, which also had a great influence on Judaism. It's called theodicy. Theodicy is that when bad things happen, you always justify God. You justify God. Here we have, you say it's, it's the big picture. God is right. We're wrong. We don't know. We probably did something wrong. Here's the thing. The Christian tradition, and it was also within Judaism we have that because we're very influenced, has a tradition of theodicy, of justifying God. The Bible has the alternative tradition of criticizing God, the hero that criticizes God. Very radical, very interesting. My question is, that, what does it mean about them? What does it mean about a civilization that admires them? Here's the classic narrative of how Western civilization gave birth to innovation. Here's the classic innovation. You could find this, let's say, in the writing Sapiens of Yuval Noah Harari, but it's across the board. It's, it goes like this. For many years, a Catholic church was somehow hypnotizing people's minds. They couldn't think for themselves. And then the church started weakening. And when the church, when the authority of the church was cracked, then people's minds was liberated from the authority of the church and of religion in general. This happens, you know, in the beginning of, you know, 16th century, 17th century, Isaac Newton. And now that they're somehow liberated for their minds are liberated from the control of tradition. Now their mind is liberated. We have a scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, and finally technological innovation, digital revolution. So the classic story is that innovation, people's minds being liberated from the control of religion led to, led to innovation. Maybe our story is different. I'm sure this is also true for Israel and Judaism, but maybe there's something else going on. Because it's hard to say that Israeli innovation is a result of the fact that we liberate ourselves from the authority of tradition. Maybe it's different. And here's the difference. Here's one line I want to share with you. I've been waiting a long time to say this line. It goes like this. <laughs> We don't need to crack the authority of tradition because we have a tradition of cracking authority. Should I say that again? I'll say it one more time. <laughs> we don't need, in order to liberate our minds, we don't need to rebel against tradition. In some way, we have to continue tradition. Why? Because we don't need to crack the authority of tradition. We have a tradition that cracks authority, the tradition of Abraham, the tradition of Gimoshe, the tradition of Gidon. This is, I think, one very big component. If you go to any high-tech high -tech company in Israel, and you'll see one thing very clear. No one is afraid to speak up. There is no authority in the room. No matter how much power, how much money people have, no one is afraid to speak up. People are, their minds are liberated. And are they liberated because we're liberated from tradition or because we have a tradition that admires liberated minds? So that's one, I think, important component in the, in the traditional Jewish genes of Israeli technological innovation. But that's not enough. The reason why it's not enough is because creativity is not, doesn't only depend on my ability to think for myself 
and not and my and my liberation from the need to satisfy power and authority. That's one condition, but that's not enough. Because as René Descartes taught, observed, the greatest threat to free thinking is not external authority like the church or a rabbi. The greatest threat is the authority that's within us. Here's how it works. Yesterday, I had an idea. What am I doing today? I am repeating that idea. Tomorrow, I'll repeat that idea again. And every argument, I'll be protecting this idea. And as a result, I'll be trapped, my, mentally speaking, I'll be trapped deeper, deeper inside this. I'll be digging myself deeper into this idea, which means many times our lack of ability to change our own minds is what keeps our creativity very, very narrow. Creativity happens when I'm willing to think differently today than I thought yesterday. It means I can have a whole new fresh set of thoughts today. And the fact that I thought something different yesterday, I'm not trapped today in yesterday's thoughts. The greatest liberation is not only when I'm liberated from, from external authorities, also when I'm liberated from myself. Which takes me to the spirit of the Talmud. Now, what's interesting about the Talmud, I mean, there's a lot, I mean, is the structure of the Talmud. And it's the following structure. The Talmud, I would say the most important thing to know about the Talmud is its structure. It's the following structure. The Mishnah, the basic text within the Talmud, the Mishnah, is this is what it is. Hillel says this, Shammai says that, that's it. There's a disagreement, and the disagreement is the Mishnah. So this is a great observation by Moshe Halbertan, that the Mishnah is the canonization of an argument. Now, at the same time that the Mishnah was canonized, roughly the same time, this is Halbertan's great observation, the Roman law was also canonized, roughly, not, not exactly the same time. And the Roman law, it's a law. And you could assume that Roman intellectuals had arguments about the law. But when the canon was created, the arguments were erased and the results, the law was canonized. The Mishnah is exactly the opposite. You can't find the law in the Mishnah, only the argument about the law. So the law is almost erased and all, everything, what becomes sacred is the disagreement itself. The first culture, and as far as I know, the only culture that canonized an argument is the Jewish tradition. Now, which means Jewish tradition expects people to study an argument. What did that do to us? When we're studying an argument, Hilo said this, Shammai said that. Well, you know what that, that did? That created a new argument, which is called the Gemara. The Gemara, all it is, is an argument between different rabbis about the meaning of the Mishnah. Now, see, the Talmud is the Mishnah plus the Gemara is the Talmud. So what's the Gemara? It's an argument between rabbis that happens for 300 years about the meaning of the Mishnah. And, but the Mishnah itself is an argument. So what is the Gemara? The Gemara is an argument about an argument. That's what it is. And now that argument is also canonized. Now the Talmud is both. So the Talmud, you have the Mishnah, it's an argument. And then the Gemara, an argument about the argument. And that's a Talmud. Now throughout generations, because this is a sacred text, so Jews are studying this text. And the, way they, and the way it's culturally designed, we study this text in Yeshivot, in Batei Midrash. And you always study this text, not like in the Western institution of a library, where you have people sitting with themselves, reading a book by themselves. A Beit Midrash is the opposite. A Beit Midrash is not a library. A Beit Midrash is where many chavrutot are sitting and studying the text. But there is a cultural expectation from the two parts of the chevruta from, this, from the couple to argue about the meaning of the text. To try to figure out the meaning of the text through the method of arguing about it. So what are you actually doing with your chevruta when you're arguing about the me, trying to figure out the meaning of the Talmud through the method of arguing about the Talmud? What are you actually doing? You're having an argument about the meaning of an argument. That's what you're doing. 
Oh, by the way, and the Gemara is an argument about the meaning of another argument of the Mishnah. So what we have here, so actually when you're studying Talmud, what you're actually doing, you're not only studying the Talmud, you're also doing the Talmud. You're also imitating the Talmud in a very deep way. You are an expansion of the Talmud. I have a question. I want to pause here. A polarized world is a world that lost its ability to have a conversation. Jewish tradition, the only tradition ever to canonize a conversation. Can we find, can, this is the biggest, this is the, the, great, great, the great question of our time. Is this, is there a Jewish solution to a universal problem? I want to keep this question in mind while we move forward. So, but the Talmud is not only about the canonization of an argument, which means that things arguing, listening, conversing has a value of its own. We should ask not only what the structure of the Talmud is, but also who does the Talmud admire? Remember, we become what we admire. Who does the Talmud admire? So I want to look, if we go back, Ariel, to what are the texts we have here in the Talmud? Um, I'll skip the bit. We don't have, I'm running out of time. So let's move to, to for, source. Oh, no, no. I was wrong. Source number four. Source number four. Okay. Okay. Amar Rav Yehuda Amarav. Rav Yehuda is a rabbi quoting his rabbi. It's a very interesting. These are very interesting people. Rav Yehuda is a person that, that comes from many worlds. So he's, he has multiple voices in his mind. He's the Talmud of Rav and of Shmuel and of Surah and Pompedita. And, um, and he says, Ein moshivin basanhedrin, ele mish yodel et aher et asher etz min ha-Torah. The Sanhedrin is the most exclusive intellectual club that ever existed in the Jewish world. The Sanhedrin. What does it take to be a member of the Sanhedrin? So here's what it takes. You have to have the ability, the capacity, to prove intellectually that the most impure animal in the world, the sheriff, is the most impure animal. It makes it so impure because just by touching it, you become impure yourself. Regular impure animals, you have to eat them to become impure. The sheriff, just by touching it. Yeah, it's like it's like COVID. You, it, okay, just by touching it, it can, somehow contaminates you. You become impure. Well, it's the most impure thing in the world. So here's the thing. If you could prove that the most impure is pure, you could send the Sanhedrin. What does it take to say to the Sanhedrin? Let's say you are a hardcore progressive liberal. If you could prove that the conservative view of very right-wing Republicans, what you see as impure, what you see as a sheritz, what you see as something that is that you might see people who believe that are bad because that worldview is evil, it's a sheritz, it's impure. If you have the capability to see something pure in the impure, to prove there's something right in their worldview, you could sit in the Sanhedrin. Here's the important point I wanna make. The rabbis didn't admire the people who could prove that they're right. They admired people that could prove that the other side is right. The greatest characteristics of the rabbis of the Talmud is their ability to listen. One of the reasons, you know, the halachic tradition is according to Bet Hillel and not according to Beit Shammai. And one of the reasons why halacha is according to Bet Hillel and not Beit Shammai is the following. Beit Shammai, in their Beit Midrash, they only taught the ideas of Beit Shammai. So Beit Shammai was a closed ecosystem where they only taught Beit Shammai. In the Beit Midrash of Beit Hillel, they taught also Beit Hillel and also Beit Shammai. Halacha is according to Beit Hillel, not because they were right, but because they were better listeners. But here's the thing. There's a price for listening. Throughout the Talmud, yeah, let's, yeah, I mean, I, 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 won't, I won't use text anymore, Ariel, so we could go back to, uh, so thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Ariel. So throughout the Talmud describes more than once, that Bet Yilil, in the middle of an argument, they change their mind and they adopt the view of Beit Shammai. So halacha is not according to Beit Shammai that never changed their minds. It's according to Bet Yilil that more than once, twice or three times, changed their minds, which means they were not trapped in their own opinions. 
what we take from the prophetic world, from the world of the Bible, is the courage to speak up, to express your opinion. What we take from the Talmudic world, Talmudic world is the modesty to change your own opinions. Where does creative creativity happen? When we have both. If you're in a conversation where people are afraid to say what they think, you'll have no creativity. But if you're in a conversation where people are entrapped in what they think and they can't change their minds, you'll have no creativity. Creativity is what happens when the biblical world and the Talmudic world meet, when we have the courage to speak up and the modesty to change. That's where creativity happens. You walk into any startup in Israel, you'll see both. You'll see people having strong ideas one day, and the next day, you know what? I think you're right. I think I'm wrong. That's what creates great conversations, courage and modesty, not being afraid to speak out and being modest enough to change your mind, not being trapped, which means you're not, you're liberated from both authorities, from external authority and our internal authority. I'm not surrendering to someone different than me. I'm also not trapped within myself. That's what creates creativity. Now, Israel, inherits this great Jewish tradition, the biblical and the Talmudic. And great because it creates great technological conversations. And great conversations create great ideas. But here's the thing. Israel is so successful technologically and it's failing politically. You know why? We have a great technological conversation and a horrible political conversation. What everything we have in a technological conversation, we don't have in a political conversation. People are actually afraid to say what they think because they might be branded in a way and people will hate them for hate them for that. And at the same time, people are trapped in their own worldview of their own tribe. And they have a very hard time changing their mind. It's actually very rare. So you're surrendering to the authority of the mob by not speaking out, to the authority of yourself by never changing your mind. And that's how it, why Israel is so not creative politically. And at the same time, very creative technologically. But we have to remember that these things are connected to each other because today's technology that is a product of creativity is killing political creativity. That's the paradox of our time. We need to be so creative to create technology, the kind of technology that is threatening our creativity, our political creativity. When I think about Israel today, this is what I think about. We have technology is how the best of Judaism is bringing the best out of Israel. Politics is how the worst of technology is bringing the worst out of us. And here's a question. Is the spirit, the Jewish spirit that's creating such a healthy technological conversation, can that Jewish spirit heal our political conversation? And if it can, if our Jewish tradition can heal our political conversation, can that be a role model for a world that lost, lost its ability to have a healthy, great political conversation where people are not afraid to say what they think and they're also modest enough to change what they think? Because if we have that political conversation, we'll have also political innovation because great ideas come from great conversations. Our political conversation is not great and that's why political, ide political ideas are not that great. Israel's position in a special place because and this, this is how I, I want to try to think about Zionism of tomorrow. Today, we take pride of Israel being the startup nation. Trying to say, what are we trying to say? We're leading the world in technology. We're so innovative. Look at all these companies. Look at all these ideas. Look at all these startups. That's great. That's nice. I'm a big fan of that narrative. I just don't think that's Zionism. Zionism at its best will be when we can start saying, Israel is not only leading the world and technological innovation, we're also leading the world in creating the culture that protects our democracies from technological innovation. That would be Zionism of tomorrow. There's a universal problem and can it have a Jewish solution? Well, the, Jew the universal problem is we lost our ability to talk to each other about loaded issues. 
The Jewish tradition is the canonization of great conversations. Can we tap into the best of Judaism to be the best out of ourselves? Can we turn Jewish solutions into Jewish Jewish solutions to create Jewish solutions to universal problems? And can Israel be the role model? And Israel is positioned to be the role model for because Israel is the startup nation. And we have to actually ask the next question. Or we can not only lead the world in, te- in, in creating technology, but also creating a healthy technological culture where our minds, our hearts, our democracy is protected from technology. That I think, now this is how I go back to Theodor Herzl. Herzl said in Judenstadt, in Medinata Yehudim, Zionism is that anti-Semitism. Meaning we need a universal solution to a Jewish problem. Alt Neuland is Zionism is about innovation. We have to find our own solutions to universal prop to universal problems. I'm not saying, by the way, anti-Semitism is over and stage one is over. I'm just saying when we think about a Zionism from tomorrow, what are we going to emphasize about this experiment of Jews having power? Jews having political loaded conversations and Jews in Israel developing the most advanced technologies. Is our, the spirit creating technology gonna heal our politics or is technology destroying our politics that I think is the greatest challenge of Israel today? And succeeding in that challenge is a Zionism for tomorrow. My friends, that was 50 minutes. Thank you so much for listening to me. I'd love to hear all your questions and comments. Okay, I'm gonna start with um, some of the questions, some of the comments that have appeared in the chat, um, even as I'm trying to process this through. So I'm just gonna read some of these and, and you'll take them as you as you can, okay? okay. So um, Rabbi, so this is from Paul Greenberg. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs noted in his book, Future Tense, that there's no modern Hebrew words for tax, civility, or diplomacy. He observed these words tend to arise in cultures that have long held power and that their approaches that need were needed to soften conflicts that routinely arose in society. But Jews have been on you, I mean, this is really kind of, we know this at Hartman, this is really core to some teachings, that Jews were so unused to power for so long, they didn't learn the art of conflict, of, of conflict containment. Assuming Rabbi Sachs' assessment of this dynamic has merit, do you think we can today learn to effectively use tact, civility, and diplomacy to soften the conflicts that routinely arise in Jewish society? And if you want, I can give you There's a little interesting gap between um, modern Hebrew and Jewish tradition. Modern Hebrew, we have tact, civility, diplomacy. We don't have the words. We don't have the awareness of softening our language when we discuss loaded issues. That's the Israeli side. But the Jewish side, we're the only, just like as Israelis, we might be the only language with no word for tact. On the Jewish side, we're the only tradition to see conversation itself as something that has value of studying and studying again, and then continuing the conversation. So in this sense, I think, I'm not saying Israel is a solution to universal problem. I'm saying Judaism has solutions to universal problems and Israel should embody the Jewish solution as a role model Mm. for the world. When I say, I'm not saying that's what Israel does, I'm saying this is our job. We are street fighters. This is what Israel should do. Thank you. Um, Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next one where somebody, um, David Phillips noted that non-Jews, and we've read about Asians, specifically Koreans, who study the Talmud on the premise that it is key, that on the premise that, and that it's the key to Israeli innovation. There's no, there's no question there, but I think there's a question about, do you want to comment on that and, and, and how to think about this through the non jews Well, I think, I think the Koreans got it. I want to share with you something. I used to remember something interesting. In 2013 or 14, or when our prime minister, Naftali Bennett, was the minister of education. When was that? It was like 2000, whenever that was. So um, this is something he shares out loud. So I allow myself to share out loud. He called me up and he asked me, listen, I have the ministers of education from all the, um, how do you call it? The OE, the advanced countries, the OECD, the O, there's 36 advanced countries. Okay. 
they're coming to Israel and they're all interested on what, how is it that Israel is so innovative? And I told them, and, and he asked me if I'm, if I am willing to give them a lecture. And I say, I have something better than a lecture. We went, we took, I took them to, with the secretary, with, with, with Bennett, we went to a Haredi yeshiva. And there's a Haredi yeshiva in Jerusalem where you could see like from the roof, you look down and you see hundreds of yeshiva boys studying Talmud. And we looked at them and I explained to them, the text they're reading is an argument and they're arguing about the text. And that's the image they got. And I said, that is the secret to Israeli innovation. <laughs> it's here. In the most not modern part of Israel, you see the genes of what's being the best out of modern Israel. <laughs> and they went back and they told Naftali, they told today's our prime minister, that out of everything that happened to them in Israel, when they tried to understand, they went to high-tech companies to try to understand like what creates innovation, going to a yeshiva of seeing like People are used to walking into a library and seeing silence. They walk into a yeshiva and they see hundreds of simultaneous arguments. And I explained to them those are arguments about arguments. So that was something, that is something that we, that we could teach the world, but to do that, we have to be what we practice. Can we have the spirit of the Talmud heal our politics, not only our technology? So I think that um, I'm gonna let you have the last word by way of, giving you Jan Schwartz's comment, because I think you kind of just spoke to it. And I'm also going to say, before I do that, is to say, to thank everyone for joining us. We had an incredible turnout from Temple Emmanuel. Um, you, it's amazing. It's amazing to be able to learn with you and to learn with you, Micha. And we hope that everyone on, will continue to join us this week. Micha, can't wait to do this again. But, um, but Jan sent, Jan noted that the sense of being stuck is also true in America. I mean, it goes back to something you were speaking about a little bit earlier, but I think it really comes to, to what we can take away here as Americans from this, which I think you were touching on, but I'll give you the last word on that and then we're gonna close. Yes, I don't know enough about America, but from what I'm reading and listening is that it's scary to talk in America today. It's scary. And when it's scary to talk because the sanction is so high for saying the no word, where it's scary to talk, it's impossible to think. And when it's possible to think, then it's impossible to be creative and be innovative. So how do you create a climate where it's safe to talk? So here, I want to share with you something I say to my students in Beit Prat. Here's something I say in the beginning of every semester. Try not to offend anyone. But make a stronger effort not to be offended. Make an effort not to be offended. And I have a sense, and maybe I'm wrong, that sometimes in America, people make an effort to be offended. And that creates, it doesn't create a safe culture. It creates a scary culture. The thought that by when everyone makes an effort to be offended, the world will be safer. No, it's scary. It's scary because people are afraid to speak and they're afraid to think. And then the world is much less, is more boring and less innovative. Thank you. I mean, really, thank you. Um, it sounds like you actually know a lot about America. Um, <laughs> so thank you for joining us. I think that's it. I wish we could continue, but hopefully we'll see each other, most of us tomorrow and see you soon, Micha. Thank you. Thank you very you much, will. my friends.